Hi everyone, can you see me any better? Is it working better? I've downsized what I'm feeding out. Um, I think I was feeding out too much. I was doing nine, I don't know what I'm doing. Basically, that's the problem. <laughs> I was doing like one 1,900 or something. So I'm now doing 1,000 and something. Is it better? Yay, oh, I'm so pleased. Okay, that's good. Oh, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. This is amazing. And yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry if we do have any teething problems today. It is my first time and I've tried to make it in a way that I can still teach you through here. So I'm using sort of an external provider to then be able to see you on my laptop. And then we've got the camera set up here, which if I just swap to that, just to see if you can see that as well. So that's so that I'm going to be able to show you things, hopefully. Um, and hopefully it's not going to be too slow. But um, as I said, we'll, we'll see how we get on and obviously really appreciate any of your feedback at the end of the time. Um, let me know what you think and if there's things that you think I need to, you know, what I can work on basically. Or if you're, you know, good at this technology stuff, if you can point me in the right direction. So um, I'm also hoping that the audio is okay because I think it's coming from my computer rather than my camera. Um, and the computer's making a hell of a lot of noise. I think it's um, quite upset by all these programs I'm running. Anyway, is it still freezing a bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, so um, welcome. And it's so lovely to see you all on, um, on live chat. And I can't believe that there's so many of you here. So my plan really for the session was obviously this was because it's the first one. It was going to be a Q&A. So I've got a couple of questions that people have sent in. If you have questions, you're welcome to pop them in the chat. Um, one of my questions to you actually is whether when you're watching the live video, do you see the chat anyway? Because you can see I've put it to this side of me, obviously. Um, but I didn't know if you actually saw it anyway. So that doesn't help. But never mind. You can let me know if, um, if that works. So I'm going to work my way through these questions that I've got, hopefully sharing some tips and things with you. And um, obviously, if you've got more questions, let me know. Or someone saying how to store PDF patterns. OK, um, a number of different ways I store my patterns. One way is um, you can see those things behind me. So I basically that's often when the pattern's been sort of cut out and when I've got various versions of it. So maybe I've made adjustments to the fit of it or it's a pattern that I've drafted. Um, and I will fold them up and put them into, into envelopes. And um, the other way I store patterns, and hang on, bear with me, <laughs> is by using these, which are pattern um, hooks. Um, they're sort of an industry thing, but you probably could find them on the internet. And you put a hole through the pattern, like this one's got here. And I would basically put all my patterns on there or all of the relevant patterns on there. So I'd obviously club the ones together and then hang them in a wardrobe space or on a rail like behind me. So that can be quite a good way if you've obviously cut them out. Um, so yeah, that's sort of two of the ways that I do. I then also have lots of rolls, which I find aren't so easy to store because I've just got rolls with sort of the labels on um, in a corner of, of the wardrobe basically. So that's probably not the best um, method, but these can be quite good. And I imagine that you can find them Probably on eBay, I would Google like pattern hooks um, is probably what they'll be referred to. Um, they come in different sizes as well. So you can get a size so that, you know, the, in terms of the height of the hang, so that it's right for your, um, you know, for the space that you're working with. So, um, oh, that's good, Laurie. Thank you. Um, and I hope I say everyone's name correctly. Obviously, if I'm reading off your questions, um, I, you know, being called Anika, people often call me Annika. So I'm used to names being, you know, said slightly wrong. So I do apologize if I say your name wrong. Um, can you um, access the videos afterwards? Yes, you can. So I have set that. Fingers crossed I've done the right thing, but hopefully you should be able to, um, to put it afterwards. Um, hole punch. Okay, I will show you the hole punch. So this is the hole punch that I showed you for, um, for the pattern here, is this hole punch here, which it's got a, so, in industry, when you have notches on patterns, they're normally cut out. If I show you, so this has got like a notcher on the one end, um, and then it's got this hole punch on the other end. So if I show you what the notcher does, I would just put my paper in just like a normal hole punch, cut it, and actually, yeah, this notcher is really rubbish because it never really cuts it very cleanly. And you get like a little 
cut out of your pattern. Um, and the same thing goes for this hole, which is what I use to, to cut the holes. But you can use like a drill hole as well, which is another sort of pattern cutting tool. And I would just pop that on and then cut. And that can be quite useful. But this, oh, the brand on it, if you want to know, is Kieran Kering, K-E-A-R-I-N-G. Um, I believe I bought it from More Plan, which is um, a company, a web-based company in the UK. Actually, I think they do have stores and they basically sell pattern cutting stuff for industry and things like that. Oh, so perfect. You're in the UK, sweet lady. And yeah, so More Plan, M-O-R-P-L-A-N. I think it's dot com. Um, they are based, I think there's a store in Bristol. There might be one in London, but they order, you can order things online and they have lots of pattern cutting tools and things. So that is definitely where I got it from. However, I don't think the notcher on this is very good. I don't use it as my notcher. I have another notcher. It may be that I got a duff one. It's just not very sharp. Um, but the hole cutter is really good. Oh, hi to Hayley in Shropshire. Lovely to see you here. Um, yes, of course, Tracy. Yeah, I'll pop a, let me write a note and I'll pop a link to it. Um, I can do that probably on the video when I finished, <laughs> we should say. <laughs> I think when I know what I'm doing, it will be easier. So, um, yes, I believe I will, I'll pop a link to that. Um, okay, so my plan, let me tell you what I had planned. And then I'll also look through, obviously, what you, um, you know, the questions that everyone's asking. I might not get through everybody's questions today. Um, I will plan to go through them and save them. And obviously then I'll be back and I'll let you know um, when I'm going to be back next on, on the live class and I can, um, I'll answer them then. So please don't worry if I don't get to your question today. So I've got quite a few people asking about a suede back adjustment. So I've got a bit of pattern ready to show you how to do that. I'm going to be showing you how to do it on the Copen pattern. Um, I'm just going to show you one method and then I will do a tutorial that shows you a couple of different methods depending on if you want to cut your fabric on the fold or if you're going to have a seam at the centre back. So, um, I, but in terms of time for a live class, I'm just going to show you the one method today. And um, I've also had a lady question things about an invisible zipper and how to make sure that you're stitching close enough and how, I believe this was Sue. So hi Sue. So I've got half a zipper ready made to show that. And I've also had questions about drafting, lots of you have asked about drafting a sleeveless version of Copen and how to do the facing. So I've pre-prepared something as well. So we'll see if we get to that. But um, that's my plan to go through those things. I'll show you how to draft a sleeveless facing as well. So we'll just see where we get to. Obviously, I understand when it's in live, it may take a little bit longer. And obviously, lots of you are asking, um, you know, that you're sending in, you know, responses and questions all the time. So I'm really sorry if I miss them because it's flashing by and I'm also trying to make sure that I do the right things that here. <laughs> so, um, Oh, so Jazzy, if you want the dress to be longer for Copen. So if you've watched my lengthening and shortening tutorial, you'll know that generally you can't just add length onto the bottom of a pattern or a sleeve. Now, the reason you can't do that is because the proportions of your body might be wrong for that. So for example, if you had a, a circle skirt and you said, I'm just going to go and add five inches, you know, 10 centimetres, whatever it is to the bottom of it, you are making a larger circle. So you're changing the design line of that garment. So the only time you can add fabric straight to the bottom of something is if it is a straight skirt, a straight dress, a straight pair of trousers, a straight sleeve. So it needs to be coming down completely straight, which Copen is. So Copen is sort of the exception to the rule. You can add length to the bottom of it. However, when you're adding length to the bottom of it, you do need to make sure that, as I said, the proportions of your body are in the right place. So it might be that actually the waist of Copen isn't in the right place for you. So you need to be making your lengthening and shortening adjustments between perhaps the bust and the waist. It might be that you need to make them between the bust and the neck. It could be that it's between the waist and the hip or the hip and the hem. You do need to make sure that you measure yourself um, and I do with the Copen pattern, I do tell you what your uh, the back length would measure, which is from the, the top sort of vertebrae at the, the back neck down to your waist. And you could compare that to the pattern. If that's correct, then you yes, you, by all means, you can just add it to, to the bottom of the pattern. And just make sure you continue the back and the front and all the edges, the side seams, perfectly straight as you go down. I hope... Um, 
um, Jazzy, you're saying if you cut on the line near the hip, so do you mean if you the cut on the top line, or so you're saying that you you need to add in volume in there? Are you are you shorter in? I'm waiting for you to reply. So I'm debating, Jazzy, whether your so is your back length measurement the same as it is on the Copen pattern? And the next question is, you could measure the pattern, the Copen pattern between the waist and the hip. And again, check that measurement on you. If that is correct, then yes, you can either add lengthen and shorten between the hip line and the bottom, or because Copen is an exception to the rule and it's completely straight, you can just add it to the bottom of the pattern. I hope that makes sense. Oh, oh yes, by all means, I will type the um, the pattern um, thing. I can, I'll type its name. I will find, I promise I'll put the link when we finished, just because I need to go and um, search for it. So that is the brand on it, pattern hole puncher, pattern hole cutter. Um, and then when, I, when we finish, I will, um, before we end, I'll go and find the, um, the link for it. Oh, hi, Laurie. Yeah, go and have a lovely lunch. Um, so thank you so much for joining so quickly. Right, I'm going to get on with, um, with some of the things that I've said I would do. So we're going to go to a sway back first, and then I'll come back and answer some questions, and we'll see how we've got on with those. Um, so sway back. I'm going to take you over to the camera there so that you can see. Okay, can you all see my back pattern piece? Now I'm going to aim to do this quicker than I normally would in a tutorial, and as I said, I will have a tutorial that I will pop up that shows you how to do a sway back. Now a sway back adjustment might be needed if you have too much fabric in the centre back of the garment. It's sort of pooling right at the centre back, right at the waist area. Now, if you need a sway back, your fabric, the excess fabric will only be at that sort of center back waist area. It will not be at the side seam. So the side seam will be fitting you fine. The, the Where the side seam of the waist is will be perfect. It's just simply that you need to remove excess fabric at the back here. So what you would need to do is you would need to draw a line across your pattern and I am going to be working with a Sharpie, as usual, as you've seen in my tutorials. Is this video loading up okay, or is it, um, is it being really slow? Please do let me know if it's being slow, and we'll forget about this for today. But um, if, if everyone can see, I will continue. So I'm going to draw a line straight across where the waist is, because that's where we're going to want to remove some excess. Now, with a sway back adjustment, you're going to be re removing it at the centre back. So you would need to work out how much you need to be you need to remove from the back waist. This would depend on um, how much fabric is on the garment. So what I recommend is when you're making the garment, make up a calico. And if you think this is an issue, then pinch out the fabric here. You'll always be pinching more at the center front, coming to nothing at the side seam. Now, obviously, then you would measure how much you've pinched. So it could be that you've got half an inch folded, which is an inch. So, or maybe a centimetre folded, so two centimetres total, but that's how you're going to work out how much you need to remove. Yes, yeah, so this has got a slip at the centre back as well. So this garment has got a seam at the centre back and a zip. Is it really slow and buffering? I will, I will continue, but let me know if it's rubbish and we'll come back to me and we can do this another time. So I would measure up that I wanted to remove, say, one inch, and I would measure that up at the centre back there. And then I would draw a line from the amount that I want to remove to the side seam. So it would be like a wedge shape, just like so. Okay, now the, what I'm showing you here is the method if you have a seam at the centre back. There are a slightly different method if you have a, if you want to cut this on the fold. And as I said, I'm gonna film a tutorial probably this week with this, but I just wanted those of you that are asking to be able to get on with your garments because I think I've had about five or six requests for this over the last couple of weeks. So I'm now gonna grab my scissors and I'm gonna cut along one of the lines. I would generally go with the top line and I'm gonna cut from the edge all the way 
to the side seam, but not through at the side seam. Now, I am working on the pattern here with seam allowances. So if I was being very correct, I should actually measure in my seam allowance on the side edge here, because I do not want to change the stitching line for the side. Am I using a, a computer camera? No, I'm not. This is my Canon camera that I film with. So if it is rubbish, it might just be that I need to sort some other software out. I'm using some software to sort of bring it through, um, but it may or may not be working well. So I do apologize if some of you aren't seeing this very well. So I've, I've drawn in my, my stitching line here, and then my cut is coming from the center back all the way to the stitching line. And then I would cut from the side seam to the stitching line. And that's what shows what happens in live because I've cut through. <laughs> Whereas if that was a video, I'd probably refilm that bit. Never mind, let me pop a little bit of tape on that. So what I am going to do now, just cut a bit further, is I'm going to slide this piece down onto that bottom line, just like so. And that is doing your sway back adjustment. So I would need to tape this in position and you can see that it has shaped the back. So if you have a garment that you want to cut on the fold at the back, you need to do a few other things. So that's why I will do a tutorial with that method as well and you're gonna tape this down. Now, you may find that you need to do some blending or truing over the back there to make sure that that sits nice and flat. And I've got a little bit of a step in my pattern pieces. The other thing that I would need to do is to sort out this dart because the bottom of this dart has become tilted. What you would need to do with that is to find the center of the dart. Oh, I'm pleased, Nancy. I'm pleased that, that's, um, that it's making sense. You would need to find the center of the dart and we would just draw a line down through the center of the dart where the dart is finishing at the bottom here. I would mark the new point on my new line and then I would just reconnect the dart legs so that you haven't also shifted the bottom of that dart because we have done that at the moment. And that is how you would do a sway back adjustment for the pattern that's got a seam at the center back. So very easy really, it's quite a simple adjustment. Um, if you've got a garment that finishes at the waist or you've got a waist seam, then it is even easier. And I will try and show that in my tutorial as well. But basically you need to remove that fabric right from the center back and leave it as it is at the side seam. Oh, I'm really pleased that that has helped um, some of you. Right, I'm going to come back and I will see. Okay, I hope that that worked okay and that you were able to see that. What is a good amount of ease to allow for a waistband on a skirt, Maria? So this depends and you will see obviously certain pattern companies add a lot more ease than others. Um, my personal opinion is I do like to keep the ease on, on the waistband of things quite small. I would generally go with about half an inch to five eighths, so about a centimeter and a half-ish um, of ease at the waist because I like to anchor my garments at the waist. I do find that sometimes if you're a larger lady, you might want to add a little bit more um, and think about, sometimes it can be useful to actually measure yourself when you're sat down because obviously when you're sat down, your waist can sort of increase and you may then find that that half an inch or five eighths isn't enough. So just do check that when you're sat down, that's still going to be comfortable for you. But I personally like to have my, my garments quite snug at the waist and they anchor the garment and allow it to sort of fit and stay in position. Cornwall Crafter, Eve, sorry. So you're saying you've made a top and it fits perfectly. You need to take four inches from the neckline. Where a bounce on the neckline? Uh, so you're saying, whereabouts is, is that problem? Is that at the front or you want to drop it or get back to me and I'll try and respond? Okay, so Alessandro, uh, four centimetres, so um, an inch and a half. No, that, that's still doable. Um, and actually I have had ladies in the past in my classes, I think probably the maximum I've done is about two inches, five centimetres. 
but um and actually I lie I may have done one lady a little bit more than that and she had a slightly sort of distorted figure um but and then you know at the end of the day we're all unique we're all completely individual and as long as once you've done it the garment looks right on you it doesn't really matter how you got, you know, how you got there. As long as you keep your grain line and, you know, you're able to get that, you know, to fit properly and nicely, then nobody's going to notice how much you took. But yes, a four centimetres is absolutely fine to take for your sway back. Um, and as I said, I will do a tutorial that shows you what you would do if you need to keep that centre back edge straight, which is if it's on the fold or if you want to have a patterned fabric, because otherwise this is going to be taking, you know, reshaping in that centre back. And if you had a check, that's not going to look the best. Okay, Cornwall Crafter. So you're saying it's two inches at the centre back and one inch either side. So I presume you're talking about the shoulders of the front and it's gaping. So have you thought about, so it fits everywhere but the neckline. What about the shoulders? Do the shoulders fit? It's because if the garment is very, it is, fits everywhere, but is very large at the neck and the shoulders, often I will say to my students to actually make a smaller size up here. Sometimes, in my opinion, some of the pattern companies can draft quite a lot larger through the, the neck and the shoulders than I've seen my customers are anyway. And um, often then you'll need to pick a smaller size. Do you need to do a bust adjustment? Have you watched those, my, those videos of mine? Have you measured your high bust and your, your full bust. Um, you could also potentially then pick a smaller size through the neck and the shoulders um, and everything and then and then do a full bust adjustment onto that if if you have a, a fuller bust. Um, if you think of the neckline as a clock face, I need to take out one inch from 10 o'clock and two inch and two inch from six o'clock. Okay. Okay. Um, would you mind sending me a picture? I think that's probably going to be the best way. I don't know if you can do it on here, but if you want to email me, info at made to sew.com, because I think you might, if your shape, if, if you've got quite a curved spine, you might find, especially at the top of the, of the neck here, you might find that actually you need to do an adjustment there where you actually need to increase the amount of fabric across, across the top part of your back. And then sometimes you do need to take darts. Um, it's, sort, it's not a dowager's hump, but sort of on the way to being like that, quite a curved top part of the back. That can sometimes be if you have issues with fitting at the, at the back neck. Um, for the front neck as well, though, I, I would think that maybe a smaller size might fit you better there. But please, if you send me, um, send me an email with a picture, I'd really appreciate it because then I can actually see without giving you an answer and it not being the right one. Um, and then I will get back to you, I promise. I can look at it this evening. It's not a problem. Ah, uh, yes, it could be if you've had scoliosis. Yes, shoulder depth is fine. It's not shaped to the waist. Okay, yes, please send me a picture and I will get back to you this evening. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll send you what I suggest for, for what I can see. It's just, I need to sort of see the shape of your body really to see how it, you know, the shape of your neck and um, at the front and at the back. Um, no, it's not a problem. I'm happy to help. I'm happy to help. Right, other questions. Has anyone else got any other questions? Can we draft a pattern from scratch? Yes, that's something I'm I'm planning on doing a video on. Um, I just yeah, I need to um, I, I yes, but bear with me. I will do I will do some pattern um drafting from scratch videos. Um, who else has anyone else got anything? How many years have I been sewing? Um, probably for as long as I can remember. Um, I I was taught to sew by my grandmother and my mother originally. Both of them sewed, and yeah, so I I was I don't know five maybe I don't remember I have a lot of students when they're first learning to sew and they say to me oh do you remember when it was difficult you know when you found it difficult to pin something and unfortunately I don't mean to be rude to them but I don't <laughs> because I've been doing it for so long it's all it's just sort of it's natural you know cutting with scissors pinning it's all very natural to me um so yes I've been sewing for a long time and then obviously yeah it was it was my career choice and I went to London College of Fashion and things like that so um Yes, it was what I wanted to do from a, for a very young age. Um, right, what else? Anyone, else? anyone else's questions? Otherwise, I will go on to the zip. Good amount of ease. Yeah, okay. If, if you asked a question earlier and I didn't see it, please feel free to re-ask it. Um, 
I don't, you know, it's just because obviously there's so many comments on here. I'm trying to uh, make my way through them. And there's another one from you, Cornwall Crafter. Cornwall Crafter I've just seen. Um, try to make it a top in a slightly stretchy fabric, but after I cut things out in the fold, okay. So if your um, if your fabric is very stretchy, very slippy, or just a difficult fabric, I would often recommend that you don't cut it out on the fold and you cut it out in a single layer instead. That would mean that you would lay the fabric out with the right side facing up, you would take your pattern pieces, and if your pattern piece said cut on the fold, so like this one does here, so this is a cut on the fold edge, so it's got the two arrows pointing in, you would need to copy this, so trace this out, and make a duplicate and stick them together along this line, try and obviously be as accurate as possible, so that when you're cutting it out of your fabric, you're cutting out one piece, so one whole front, rather, and then you don't need to cut it on the fold. But yeah, if your fabric is very slippy, then yeah, that's generally a good idea. I also, a way that you can check this is when you fold your fabric in half, right sides together to cut it out, if that folded edge is twisted at all, it either means that you haven't lined it up properly, so you might need to give it another shake. And, and one thing I, as well I sort of say is those edges that were cut in the shop, so the horizontal edge or the horizontal grain, um, not the vertical grain that you're going to be pinning together, but the horizontal cut line in the shop, they might not have cut that straight. So do not pin, pin that one on top of each other because that's going to make your grain line along the fold maybe be off and that will, will also cause the twisting. So often give it a bit of a shake. If you still can't get that folded edge to sit nice and flat, then I would recommend cutting out in a single layer. Really, that's sort of the best way to make sure that you don't end up with problems. Um, how far down do you put the top of the invisible zipper? Okay, so this depends on what I'm doing. And let's go to my, I'll go to my invisible zipper actually now, because I had a few questions about this. So the top of the invisible zipper, if, let's take an example that you're working with a skirt. You've got a skirt that's got a facing, so the facing's going to come round and go to the inside, or you've got a waistband that goes straight across the top. Now, depending which one I was working with, I'd give myself a little bit of extra. So if I'm just going to put a, a waistband on, I'm just going to sew straight across the top of that zip, then I would put the top little plastic zip stopper, so right at the top you get the little plastic bits, I would put the top of that five eighths, 1.5 centimeters down from the edge of the fabric or whatever seam allowance you're working with. So I would measure down the seam allowance and I would put the top of that plastic stopper. But that's only if you're gonna be sewing neatly across the top of the zip, adding a facing, adding, sorry, adding a waistband, a top of the zip, adding a waistband. If you were going to be adding a facing, which a facing sort of ends up pulling this all down onto the inside, I always feel that the zip needs a little bit more space. So I generally always give it an extra, approximately an extra eight, um, two millimeters. Sometimes I'll give it a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the fabric, but that would be the general amount. So I'd measure down from the top, one eighth, two to three mil more than the seam allowance, and then put the um, plastic zip stopper. I hope that answers your question, Pam. Oh, Jan was talking about ripping fabric to straighten it. Yes, yes, you can by all means rip your fabric to straighten it. Uh, be cautious with it. And I oft, I generally find that there aren't many fabrics that you actually can rip without not ruining them, but you don't want to be, you don't want, yeah, you don't want the, the, that edge to look sort of all ripped and fraying and what have you. So I always do that with my calico. When I'm making my twirls, I will cut into the fabric along the along the selvage edge, cut in at a right angle, and then I will rip it. That's always what I will do. Um, if I'm working with a cotton or something like that, then I will often do that because then I know that that horizontal is straight or it's at a right, or I should say it should be at a right angle to the grain line. Um, however, if you have got a delicate fabric, you may not want to do that. And some fabrics you won't be able to achieve a rip. So, you know, don't bother with those. So just, just test it first right on the edge of the fabric perhaps before you, you know, cut a big bit in and rip it away. Okay, so, um, right, let me go to this invisible zipper that we're talking about. So I'm gonna swap you back to the other camera. Okay, so the questions that I had on the invisible zipper. Let me move this pattern piece out the way. 
So I had um, Lovely Sue asked about the invisible zipper. How much seam allowance do you need? And I presume you're talking, are you talking at the top there, Sue? Um, obviously, in terms of how much seam allowance you need for an invisible zipper, often it would just be, if I was working with a garment that I drafted, or it was an industry, it would probably be um, a centimetre or three eighths. Um, obviously, if you're working with a dressmaking pattern, it may be more. So I've sort of gone for a, a 5 8 1.5 centimetres here, because that's what a lot of dressmaking patterns use. But um, yeah, it, it, it just depends. So I presume that's what you've, have you commented, Sue, yet? No. Okay. Oh, I'm glad it's all working, video and audio. That's really good. Okay, so then we also said about pre-finishing the edges. Yes. And... I forgot to do this, which is why I've now cut mine with pinking shears. <laughs> so I meant to go on my overlocker and finish these. So I would always pre-finish the edges prior to inserting the invisible zipper. I would use the overlocker. I My rule with the overlocker, um, for myself anyway, is that I generally use a three thread overlocker when I just want to finish the edges of things. If I'm joining something together, so I'm creating a, a jersey garment or a garment from a stretch fabric, then I will use a four thread. Now, so I would pre-finish this, and I'm generally, you'll, you'll have noticed this probably in the cope and pattern, if any of you have made it, that I do try and think about how I'm going to finish a garment as I'm constructing it. So for example, I would, taking a, a pattern like the cope and pattern, I would finish the side seams and the shoulder seams on the overlocker before I sewed bits together. Um, and then I would join the side seams together and then I would overlock the bottom as so it was flat before I sewed the back seam because I don't like to generally go and, and overlock around a circle unless I have to. So with sleeves, you have to, but with a, with a hem of a sleeve or with the hem of a garment, you can overlock it flat before you join it together. And I just think it looks a bit neater. So, with the um, zip that we have got here, right, sorry, I'm just bringing the questions down to the bottom. Okay, so the other question, so I would, yes, I do recommend that you overlock or finish them. If you don't have an overlocker, then obviously you can do um, um, the over edge stitching, you can do a zigzag, or you can use pinking shears. Now, you, you can do that once the zip is in, but generally I find that it's easier to do the sort of finishing first. With the pinking shears, I would do it once the zip was in, though. And yes, you were talking about um, how do I remember which direction the second half of the zip goes in? I get it all twisted. It is, it is tricky. So this is the seam that my zip is joining in. Obviously, I've finished both of those edges and I've got my right side up. Now, I always suggest when you're doing the second side that you zip the zip back up. So the zip is here. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can remember this. The way that I generally teach most of the time is the right side of the zip has to go on to the right side of the fabric. Now, when you open the zip up again, so if we hold it at the top here and open it up, I always say that you have to open the zip like a book. So this side has to open outwards because I could achieve the same thing by turning the zip under. The right side is still on the right side of the fabric. But if you remember with the zip, so I would always recommend that you fasten it first because then it sort of gets everything in order and then hold the top, unfasten it. And remember that this side of the zip has to open up like a book to go onto the other side of the fabric, just like so. And then this whole piece can come across. So you can also look at it this way, and some people do. They say that the zip, a zipper has to go face down onto that right side of the fabric there, and with it like that, there's only really one option. Obviously, also check that you haven't twisted your garment anywhere. I know people in the past that perhaps have making many panelled skirts or things, and there's been a twist somewhere in the garment, but the zip was going in correctly. So just check that your garment is lying in flat. So that's, I hope that helps Sue. I don't know if, I, I think I probably covered that in my Invisible Zipper tutorial, but um, that's generally what I, the way that I describe it, opening it like a book and always opening outwards. So both sides, when the zip was in its original position, both sides, one would be going that way, the other would be going that way. So it's literally like you've grabbed a book and you've gone open. And this one would have gone like so, and that one has opened out the other way. Okay, 
Now, the other question was about sewing and how close to sew to the teeth. I'm gonna pop back in so you can see me while we chat about this because I don't think you need to see the zip, right? Okay, how close? Now, this is a tricky one because I believe that it can depend on the zip and it can also depend on the invisible zipper foot. Now, if you have a sort of cheapy invisible zipper foot, you know, like a, a universal one that they often sell for machines, that can sometimes be the problem because I have found people in the past that have come to my classes and they've had an invisible zipper foot, but the grooves for the zip to sit in are almost too large. And it's either that they don't work with the zip that they've brought or the grooves in the actual foot are actually too large. So when you're running the teeth of the foot through the groove, it's, it's not pulling it apart and therefore it's not being able to sew it as closely. You do want to make sure, I would suggest that, I sort of suggest really that most of my students, they buy two feet for the sewing machine that does that might not come with them. One being an invisible zipper foot if they're into dressmaking and the second being a walking foot because again, I really like that. And I just would say maybe try and purchase one that's, you know, is branded. So if you've got a Janome, it's Janome. If you've got a Benina, it's Benina. Um, Husqvarna brother, you know, who whatever machine you've got, try and purchase the one that is branded and it might cost you a little bit more, but obviously, you know, hopefully you'll get better results. The other thing is down to the zip. So like I said, it's the same problem really. It's either the fact that the grooves, so those little grooves in the bottom are too wide for the particular zip or they're too wide in general, or the teeth of the zip are a little bit, um, narrower or they're not quite the right shape for the groove. And I generally find this with sort of cheapy zips again. So some of my customers will come in and they'll have just, you know, bulk bought some invisible zips because they were super cheap off eBay. And I have problems with those in the past. It's like the teeth are almost, it's very cheaply made. So it's very, it, the, it's not designed for the foot is what I'm trying to say. And the foot can't, because what the foot is supposed to do is you're running that zipper through and it should be pushing those teeth out and they'll only fit in if those teeth are pushed out to the side, which allows it then to sew really, really close. You, you will find that you get a little bit of leeway with your, um, with your needle position if your machine allows you to do that. So for example, most of the time I will leave my needle position bang in the middle of my foot, but there are times when I'll sew it a little bit closer or a little bit further away. So if perhaps you've sewn a very thick fabric, lace, something like that, I'll often move the, the needle a little bit away from the zip. Because the fabric's so thick, the zip will still look invisible, but um, it won't be really stiff when you try and undo it because that's the problem if you sew really too close, it'll be very stiff to undo. Does that answer your question, Sue? Oh, you said thank you, yes, okay. Okay, I hope that was, it's a difficult one really. And as I said, I do think it is based on zips. So if you're, you know, planning on buying some, try and buy, you know, still go to eBay because it can be cheap or Amazon or wherever, but I would still try and buy YKK, Opti, branded ones if you can, because I do think they're easier. The same, I had a lady in the other day actually, and the stopper of the zip was, was sort of didn't really exist. Um, the zip didn't come off at the top, but it was very difficult to see where the zip actually started in terms of positioning that in the right place, like we talked about, to position it down from the top edge of your fabric for when you're putting a facing or a waistband on. So, um, okay, right, that's the zip question with Sue. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Um, where do I buy my fabrics from? I saw that um, question. Okay, um, Generally online, I would say, in, in the UK. Um, I trips to London now and again um, when I've got the time. And obviously London's amazing because you can walk around and there's sort of streets of fabric shops. Um, but generally speaking online, so if you're in the UK, some of the shops that I shop at, um, Truro Fabrics, so they're online and they're, they are also in Truro. Um, I haven't been to them recently. And um, one of my ladies said the fabric shop in Truro wasn't as good as it once was. Um, I can't vouch for that and um, they, they're often different. So what's online to what's in store is different. Stone fabrics are very good as well. Um, they're based in Totnes, I think. So again, South, South England. Um, Fabric Godmother, um, I'm trying to think who else. Calico Lane can be, what you said, I think that's up north somewhere or Manchester way maybe, I'm not quite sure. But um, they were quite good online for like Ponteroma jerseys. I used to buy a lot from them actually when I was making Ponteroma jerseys, but that's probably going back about five years. 
Um, Joel and Sons, I love Joel and Sons, but the prices are expensive, but their fabric is like, yeah, wonderful fabric. Um, if you're ever, obviously, you know, I, I would say, and if you ever go to Paris, Paris is amazing for fabric. The fabric district in Paris is incredible. So um, save up for a trip to Paris, I would highly recommend. Um, so yeah, generally online. And I, and I do take that risk in the fact that I either buy a sample or I might like it, I might not. And that's fine with a cheap fabric, but obviously if you've, if you've purchasing an expensive fabric and then it's not what you wanted, I will say that often when I buy stuff from Joel and Sons, I like, I like their remnants area, which is sort of the area where they have a little bit left and, um, and they have them at bargain prices or bargain prices from what the fabric was originally anyway. And I love the remnants. So that's always good. And I, I generally find with Joel and Sons that even if it, the fabric isn't what I expected, I, um, it is, yeah, it's still lovely because it's so designer and Italian and just beautiful. Um, so yeah, that's a, there's a few places. Um, I will do a little bit of a blog post, I think, on, on my website about this because I'll write, write sort of a big list of all the places that I generally buy things from and what I get because then hopefully it will help some of you that are in the UK and that are looking for things, or at least in Europe, um, you might be able to get stuff. So, um, okay, now how are we doing for time? Shall Do we have time to do the... Do you want me to go over the um, the garment with the facing? Um, I can do that, how you would do that. I haven't sewn it, but I can sort of pin it. Or I'll try and go through more of your questions and we can do that next time. Oh, Celia, what do I do if I'm a size three, but my arms are a size four? I presume you're talking about the coping pattern. And I believe I replied to you, or I'm not sure. I've definitely spoken to Beth who will reply to you. So I did, I'm sorry if you haven't got the email because she asked me the question. Now, and my question in response was, um, is it your bicep that you're talking about? So I um, presume that the size three everywhere else, perhaps your shoulders is correct in a size three, but it's the bicep of the size three that isn't going to fit you. In which case there are a number of ways that you can make that adjustment. You can simply, you know, you, you could cut a size four on um, across the sleeve. So not at the top of the sleeve cap, but you could cut it across, which will give you that sort of wider breadth for your bicep. If you do that, you would then need to increase to a size four here. Um, you could blend quite quickly into a size three, but you would need to increase to a size four, otherwise the sleeve wouldn't fit. You could still cut around the armhole at the three and around the top of the sleeve cap at the three, um, if you think that your shoulders and everything are going to be a size three. The other option is that you do a bicep adjustment. So you actually add fabric in right into the center of the sleeve. Um, and that is a tutorial I will try, I can try and get that done this week or next. Um, you basically slice the sleeve horizontally and vertically and sort of spread it to add volume in. So then you could cut a size three sleeve, but add the volume that you need for your bicep, if that is the case. Kieran, what would I recommend to someone who wants to start sewing? Um, is that in terms of a project to do or, yeah, what, 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 I suppose, give it a go. Don't be hard on yourself about making mistakes because we all make them. You know, there's plenty of garments, even nowadays, that I'll make mistakes on. And I like my things to be right. And I get so cross with myself, especially if it's a stupid mistake. Like I think the jacket behind you, I um, because it's a leather jacket, it's lots of, um, lots of gluing goes into it. And when you finish the jacket, because the jacket's what's called bagged, which means that the jacket and lining are sewn inside out and you turn it back through, another tutorial I must do for you all. And you basically have to put your hand in to glue up the hem. And I obviously didn't know how much glue I was doing, squeezed too much glue into the hem and it came out on the back of the jacket. I think because it's suede and now I've worn it, it's not really that noticeable, but I was so cross with myself and this was literally just before the photo shoot. So don't be hard on yourself when you're learning. We're all learning and we are always still learning. You know, there's still things that you can learn. So don't be hard on yourself. Start with something basic. Um, maybe like a cushion cover, literally a square cushion cover, something like that. And also just have a go with your machine. If you haven't got a machine, maybe you can borrow one from somebody because it might be nice to borrow one to check that it's gonna be a hobby that you want to do before you know you go out and spend the money. And just you know have a go, have a play, throw different fabrics at it, see how it responds. Obviously I've got loads of tutorials and I've got lots of tutorials on little um, projects as well. I haven't got a cushion and um, I will plan to do something like that, but I've got lots of little wash bags. I've got like lavender hearts, like lots of little things that you can just try. And if the first one doesn't come out as you want it to, 
don't be hard on yourself. Just give it another go and try, I would just generally suggest that you work with easy fabrics. So I would say that's stable fabrics like cotton and sort of lightweight home furnishings. So dark manipulation, why is it always on the, the top part of the bodice? It isn't. You can manipulate darts on the bottom part of the, of the bodice as well. So you can, I don't know if you've seen, um, in the background of some of my videos, you might have seen a Riva dress, it's called. It will either have been pink or it would have been in um, in a Czech fabric. Oh, actually, it's here. Let me grab it for you, see if I can show you, see if it's clear enough. But basically, the darts at the waist of this have been manipulated so that they are asymmetrical. Right, let me zip her up. So I hope, can you see? Uh, it's difficult in the check, but there's a dart here and it's basically become pleats rather than darts, sorry. So there's a pleat here and a pleat here. So I manipulated the um, the darts that were at the at the sort of waist seam into to create those. So yes, you can. The, the reason obviously darts exist in areas where you have fullness or where you have shape on the body. So that's why much more of it happens on the top of the body because you know, in, in, in women's wear, you have a bust. So you're generally manipulating them around to work. You've got a dart there because of the bust and you need to create shaping for the cup. So dart manipulation allows you to amend the design lines very easily. Um, and it allows you to move that dart. Otherwise you would be stuck with a side dart all the time, which, you know, isn't gonna be the world's greatest design. Um, but yes, by all means, you can play around with moving them. You just need to be cautious um, in places like the back and stuff like that, because you don't want to be adding a cup or shaping in that area because you haven't got um, a cup in the back. So you just got to think about what they point towards and where the volume is originally, but you can have a play and do a little bit of manipulation in other areas. And obviously if you're working for some really wacky design, you can go for it and add darts and pleats and everything wherever you want. Um, because if that's the design of the garment that you've created, then yeah, then that's nice. When can you sew this dress? Okay, this is this is gonna be a pattern, I promise. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to you all the time about my patterns on my website and, sorry, it got caught, uh, it got caught on itself. Um, yes, I it will be a pattern very soon, um, as will this one and the jackets. They're all gonna be patterns that um, you'll be able to get on my new website. It's just time more time consuming than I imagined and um, yeah, everything, um, it all takes time and it's always, also I'm dealing with other people, so I'm waiting on them. So like I'm waiting on my web designer to do some things. I have a chap that I currently draft, although I have pattern cutting software, I need to learn how to use it. <laughs> so um, that's my learning experience. And I, yeah, so I need to learn how to use that. But in the meantime, I draft um, flat and I have to have them digitalized. And so I'm waiting on somebody to make sure that they're digitalized. And then when they come back from being digitalized, they're sometimes not correct or things have changed. So yes, it is a, it's just a long winded process, but I'm hoping that I've got, I've got, you know, a good collection of patterns that I do hope to launch soon. Just please bear with me. And I'm sorry to keep you all waiting. I wish I had more hours in the day. The other question that I did have actually um, was from Lorianne. I hope I've said that correctly about, um, am I sponsored to teach you or am I sponsored to make videos? No, none of my videos are sponsored. Um, yeah, I, I suppose making videos was actually something that happened by accident and it's been incredible that there are so many of you that are actually interested in learning and in supporting me. So thank you all so much. Um, yeah, I, I basically began probably, I think I started about three years ago this summer properly with the beginners, the few beginners tutorials I did. But the reason I made videos was originally because I'm teaching in-person classes and I would have people that then would send me an email or call me and say, I've forgotten how to put that zip in, or can you remind me how to do this? And I thought, I'm getting so many of these phone calls and things, I need to actually be able to share with them something so that it could save my time. Um, and that's where the YouTube started. I never really planned to have a channel that would be successful and, and that people would like. So thank you all, um, thank you all very much for supporting me. Um, in terms of, I know one of the, um, I think Lorianne sort of asked where, you know, where do I, where does my business make money, I suppose? And can you make money from a sewing business? And it definitely wasn't something that I thought would be possible. I didn't, I don't know if you, I, I will do a sort of an about me. And I don't know if you've watched um, my bit on that sewing blab the other day, because I did speak a little bit about how I got into, to made to sew my business um, today. But very quickly, I, when I originally left the fashion industry, I worked um, 
I basically started my own um, clothing brand. I then had problems within about nine months with a trademark and lost everything that I started with pretty much. Um, I then went into doing um, bespoke things. So I was doing um, bespoke clothing for people, generally for weddings, mother of the bride, um, bridesmaids, those kind of things, which I enjoyed. But it, that is where I would say it is difficult to make a living from because people that don't sew expect so much for nothing really partly because of the high street. It's so cheap to buy things on the high street nowadays. And you can go into these shops and buy a top for £10. Or I don't know what that is in dollars, but you can, you know, you can get stuff cheaply. So people don't want to spend the money and they don't expect it to take you that long to make it. Um, for example, I had a lady that would say, oh, can you, can you bead this dress for me from the bottom up, hand beaded? That won't take you very long, will it? And you're thinking, yes, it will. <laughs> so um, that's, and then I basically by accident started teaching. So I had a customer that I was making or doing some tailoring for. She sewed and wanted to learn tailoring. And that is how Made to Sew started, um, 2013, 2012, 2013-ish. So um, I generally, my business runs from my in-person classes. That is how, you know, that's how, how my business is supported. Um, I am a Benina brand ambassador, but they don't give me any money for making videos or anything <laughs> or money for sort of, you know, launching machines or anything like that. That's just... Um, yeah, I've, I've had some lovely connections and things out of it. And I know those of you that know I'm coming to Chicago, I'm going to Benina University. Again, I'm funding my trip, but I just want to see what it's all about. Um, so, yeah, so that's really how, how my business works. Oh, thank you, Jan. That's really kind of you. Thank you. Um, right. Any other? So back center. Oh, hang on. Sorry. I think I'm lost. I need to go to the bottom of this. Oh, thank you. That's all, all such lovely comments. Thank you so much. Yes, um, Schmetz needles do have a really good guide. Is that someone asking about what size needle? Oh, how do you know the different needle sizes? So generally, yes, Schmetz do have a good guide as to what you should use when. Um, generally speaking, in terms of needle sizes, it's your everyday needle is an 80, 12, 90, 14. So I believe the 80 and the 12 are the metric, the nine, yeah, the no, sorry, I'm lying. The 80 and the 90 is the metric figure. The, um, 80, 12. The 12 and the 14 is the imperial figure, I believe. Don't quote me on that though. And um, most of the time they will put both on the packaging. But 80, 12, 90, 14, that's going to be your everyday cottons, your sort of home, like lightweight home furnishing fabrics, um, linen, those kind of things. The lighter weight fabrics need a smaller sized needle. So your silks, chiffon, anything that's very fine or even that's closely woven like a microfiber kind of thing can sometimes need a smaller needle or can definitely need a smaller needle. You're going to need a smaller needle number. So that's going down in size. So that's going to be a 70, 11, I think it is, um, 65, 9, that kind of thing, moving down the scale. And then obviously the opposite is true for going up the scale. So it's going to be increasing that, um, that needle number. So 116, 110, 18, for thick fabrics, thick denim, upholstery fabrics, those kind of things. There are needles obviously for other jobs, like a leather needle may be required for sewing leather. However, in my opinion, needles are also, there are certain needles you need. So a ballpoint needle or a jersey needle, 100% you need that when sewing a jersey fabric or a knitted fabric. That's because the knit of the fabric is often quite close together. If you use a normal needle, it has a sharp tip and it can cut the knit and you will find that it will start to run like a pair of tights. So you need to therefore purchase a ballpoint needle, it has a smooth ballpoint to the point, and that will separate the knit rather than cut it. That is the really, you must use that needle when you're working with your, your knits. However, there are other needles um, for different things, and some of them I find useful, some of them I haven't found so useful. So a leather needle, I actually sewed that jacket and would recommend to my customers that they sew that with a normal needle. You do not need another leather needle for that. A leather needle has like a wedge shape on the bottom, and it will actually cut the leather, which can be useful if you've got a really, really thick leather, but that was quite a, um, a fine, it's a pig suede, so it isn't too thick. And a normal needle is absolutely fine on that. So, you know, test it before you get sold by, you know, the needle for this super fabric is what I'm trying to say. So just test what you've got first. If you need that, then obviously go and buy it. So, do people notice if you messed up your fabric? Um, 
what do you mean by messed up your fabric? Do like if you made a mistake in your garments or you've had an issue with something? Often, no, probably not. And I think that's the thing is that, you know, I, I, I think I said earlier on when we were chatting that I'm, I, you know, I do like my things to be right. And I get quite cross with myself if I make a mistake or if something goes wrong. And I have this sort of cupboard of um, seconds, you know, pro projects that haven't gone right for whatever reason. And it might just be the minutest of thing and it gets put in this cupboard. And often I will then go back through the cupboard and I think, oh, that's a really nice jacket. What happened to that jacket? That looks amazing. And I will not even know what the problem was and why it ended up in the cupboard in the first place. Sometimes this can be a few months, sometimes this can be a few years. But um, I had a jacket where um, it was the one of the first ones I made of actually that Paxton jacket behind you and the pattern matching I think I made the bot the the bodice and then because it was the first one and then I was popping the sleeves on and I cut them out later basically the pattern on the fabric is hardly noticeable um but I didn't cut the sleeves right they're symmetrical but they're not 100% right and so it ended up in that cupboard for a period of time a couple of years I think and then eventually it's come out and I've gone actually you don't really notice it. No one else is really going to notice it. So we are hard on ourselves as sewists. I think you know the mistakes that you've made and other people that are going to be looking at you or you're making something for aren't going to notice what you notice. Um, yes, you're talking about a serger being different to a sewing machine. Yeah, you can by all means use a zigzag stitch to, to finish the edges of your fabric. You can also use an overcast stitch which is a stitch that um, often looks a little bit like a zigzag. Sometimes it's just a one step to the side, but it will go over the edge of the fabric ever so slightly. Um, you generally need a foot for your machine to do that well, to stop the fabric from curling under. Um, it is another tutorial that I plan to do, the overcast um, one. So I will try and do that in the, in the coming weeks for people. But you can do a zigzag. You can do a very small zigzag. I think on my machine, it's normally like a two width, one length or something like that. And then I will cut next to it, close to it. So often the little zigzag, I do often do once the garment is made because then you're gonna be trimming down that seam allowance. So you zigzag first and then trim next to it. Um, and then that will stop it from, from curling under. Um, but yes, the serger or overlocker is a different machine. Um, I can grab mine for you if you wanna see what it looks like. Two seconds. harder to get out than I thought. So this is an overlocker or serger. So a very different machine and you can see that there are space of four threads on the back. It's quite heavy as well. <laughs> so hot in my room because I've got all my lights on and the windows are closed, the curtains are closed to try and stop the light from affecting it. So yeah, it's pretty warm here. Right, yes, the light, yeah, when does the live video end? It is supposed to end now. Um, I wanted to run over a little bit because we started a bit late. So um, I'll just ask that, answer the last question from Angel Cat. Is a zigzag stitch or pinking steers better? Either, really. Um, I would say if your machine has got an overcast stitch, that normally looks neater. And most machines do have one. So I would maybe check the manual or, or you know, if you haven't got the manual, perhaps Google your your machine make a number, see if you can find the manual. But they, most machines nowadays do have one, or at least newish machines will have them, even the basic models. Um, and yeah, so I would suggest that over a zigzag or pinking shears. I think a lot of the time I actually would prefer pinking shears because sometimes the zigzag can look a little bit not neat, whereas the pinking shears you probably don't really notice. So if I had to choose, I think I might choose pinking shears, which I'm not sure if that yeah, is a good thing or not. But if you can do an overcast ed or over edge stitch, I would recommend that. So, um, oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, everyone. Has it been okay? Yeah, so really it's feedback time now. Let me know what the problems were. Um, do you want to be able to see the, the what was this side of me, the chat box? Because obviously I've put that up on the video. I didn't know if you could see it anyway or if it's important that you want to see that. Um, and really, what do you want from these live videos? Do you want me to show you things like I did? Um, obviously, it's always going to be have to be a little bit quicker and not quite as in depth as my tutorials. But is that useful? Or would you rather we just chat, people ask questions, I answer questions. I, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's over to you guys, what you want and what you want to get out of it. But 
I hope to probably do maybe like two of these a month, maybe if, maybe more. Um, and I'm, I will do another a one at a different time zone purely because I know that there are some people that are up late and some people probably that couldn't make it because I think it's 2, 3 a.m. in Sydney, Australia. And I knew I had a few Australians that wanted to join in. So I'm sorry if you weren't able to be here. You like the Q&A, Laura? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I'm more than happy for it to be a Q&A. I may... If people are happy to send in their questions beforehand, then like I did really, I can sort of pre-prepare things. And if there is a question that I can show you just so that it makes more sense, then I'm happy to do that. So I will um I'll come up with a plan as to what day I'm gonna do the next one. Um is Sat I presume weekends are a good day for people because it does mean that no matter what time zone we're in, people can join. Um yeah, oh, I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased this has been so good. Oh, thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for joining me. And I wish you all the best of your sewing. I'm, yeah, I'm a bit delayed on my um, small bus adjustment tutorial that some of you will be um, expecting. It will be going live after this because it's ready. So um, I will pop that up and then you'll see more of me, um, yeah, next week. So I will, I'll let everyone know when the next live class is going to be. And... Is, has the audio been okay? That's my only other question because I don't, I think the audio is feeding in from my computer rather than the, my, I've got a microphone on my camera. So I will get an external mic if you think the audio isn't very good. Um, but yeah, let me know and I will see you all soon. Thank you all so much. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Laura. I'm pleased the audio was good. Thank you. Oh, thank you all so much. Oh, I'm really pleased. Right, I will go and actually, before we finish, let me just grab that link from um, More Plan and then I can pop it onto, um, if I can find it, pop it onto the feed, find what they've called it, if they've called it the same thing that I have. Yes, and please, if you didn't get your question answered, I will go back through this right now and I will write down those questions. So please don't think that if I haven't answered your question, it's not going to be answered. I will answer it next time, I promise. So um, it's just very difficult because I've got, you're all writing questions so quickly and I'm trying to also explain something and then trying to see what you've written. So I will, um, yeah, I will of course write down anybody's questions that haven't been answered. I'll go through that now, now when we finished and I will, um, yeah, get back to you. And we'll, right, let's see if I can, if I can't find this quickly, I will, um, because I'm trying to think if they've called it the same thing that I've called it, <laughs> if I can search for it. Oh no, it's not coming up. Right, I don't know how long the, the, um, the comments stay live on here. I don't know if I press end, whether you're not going to be able to see me anymore. Uh, shop equipment. Sorry, everybody. I promise we'll end this in a minute. <laughs> you can all go and have a nice afternoon, day, evening, whatever time it is. Right, can I find it? Uh, maybe they don't have one anymore. Right, I will pop it on. Uh, my computer's being slow now. I will go so that you can all go and I will pop it, try and pop it in the chat in a second. If I can't pop it in the chat, I'll try and pop it underneath this video if I can do that. Um, and if not, I will get it ready to share next time. Okay. Um, that, oh, you can see the comments. Thank you so much, Cornwall Crafter. Yeah, I'm a little bit, I am completely new to this and I was trying to Google it and find out what, what happened, whether you could see comments, whether you couldn't. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah, and happy sewing, everybody. Have a lovely rest of your weekend. Take care and I will see you soon.